Chris Hildebrandt. I'm the Chief Operating Officer with the Center for Disability Rights. The uh, Center for Disability Rights has been here in the Rochester community since it was incorporated as an all-volunteer organization in 1990. Um, primarily we're known as an advocacy organization, but we also do pretty extensive services in people's homes in the community. Um, I, I think what you see in the video is pretty striking. Right? I mean, it's a little hard to react without knowing sort of what happened before the video, and some of the video is so blurry, and the um, person taking the video is very colorful in her narrative of the circumstance. Um, but I, I mean, what you see is very striking and certainly bears good investigation. Um, some of what we have heard outside of uh, what you see in the video that, that is of concern, um, uh, that they left his wheelchair there. Um, so that, that is of concern to us that in reading the uh, RPD protocols on working with people with disabilities, there's nothing that really addresses um, how do you arrest a person in a wheelchair? And if you have done so, what do you do with their mobility device? So I'm curious, does CDR have any role in like drafting this or having a conversation with the police department? Um, what I see there probably, it, we did not have a role in it. Um, a lot of it looks like it's been established for a while. I think it, I think it acknowledged that it was updated in 2007. Um, but we didn't have any role in that. I'm not sure if they worked with anybody in the disability community or not. Are the police following this general order when they arrest Mr. Ward? I didn't see anything in the general order that really addressed how to. Um, in the circumstance that we see in the video, I don't see anything there that really talks about how do you make that arrest. That whoever side of the story, like if, you, if we're going to take the police side of the story, that he took a swing at them. Um, I don't see anything there that, that describes, okay, so, so a guy in a wheelchair has taken a swing at you, then what? Um, so I, I think that they probably, something certainly that could come out of the you know, circumstance for Mr. War is um, a look at and an improvement on the, the general order uh, for RPD and working with people with disabilities. The thing that jumped out for me because of the situation with Mr. War is uh, protocol around, well, what do you do with the mobility device? Um, that if you transport somebody you know, downtown to the jail, um, leaving their wheelchair someplace else is not acceptable in my opinion. I don't know the law, I don't know how it's addressed elsewhere, um, but when he gets to wherever he's going, if they separated me from my wheelchair, when I get to wherever they're taking me, I need my wheelchair back. Um, so I think there, there needs to be a means of transporting and, and making those arrangements that if you can't put a power chair in a police cruiser, I understand. Um, but how do you get that power chair to where the person is going? Well, I'm wondering, do the police have a, like a specialized response team for pe to to engage with and interact with people with disabilities, or don't? Um, to the extent of my knowledge, there's a couple of um, subsets within RPD where officers have specific uh, training or knowledge. Um, we have we have been very active with RPD in a deaf um, liaison uh, that they have an officer who's who's fairly proficient in sign language and. Um, has done a lot of proactive work and we started some proactive work under Chief Moore and have continued some of it under Chief Shepard uh, between the deaf community and RPD. Um, I know in the past they've had some officers that had um, some specialization around uh, people with mental health disabilities. Um, outside of that I'm not aware of any. I'm not aware of any uh, generalized or specific trainings about disability except for there's some references in the general orders. We got very involved in the relationship between RPD and the deaf community because there was a um, what started as a pretty routine traffic stop that really escalated into an ugly incident. Um, so we got involved in that and helped bring RPD together with the deaf community to try to prevent any um, tragedies from happening, essentially. Uh, so I think that that's where we got involved. I haven't been aware of any other um, you know, situations between RPD and somebody with a physical disability. Chief Shepard has said, um, for deaf people, he will always hang them behind, his, the, behind their backs because mm -hmm. the safety of his officers come before that person being able to communicate with the officers. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's your understanding or if that's just hearsay and you don't um, know. No, I, I've definitely heard that Chief Shepard say something to that effect, that I think that he has uh, indicated that at initial arrest he would always want the person cuffed behind their back. Um, he indicated sort of a flexibility of when they get to another situation where you know, the officer deems it more safe, like when they're, you know, downtown in a detention holding or whatever, um, that that might be a time to uncuff the person or move the cuffs to the front um, so that when the officer feels there's less potential danger or more control over the situation that they could change that. I think that's true what Chief Shepard has said. 
Uh, well, I, I feel how my deaf people tell me to feel, uh, and they are not thrilled with it, <laughs> to be an understatement. But I think that um, where our deaf folks really feel that essentially their communication is being cut off, um, and that's unfair treatment. So we have definitely been involved with RPD and other um, levels of law enforcement about handcuffing people, deaf people who use sign language in front of their bodies. It, we're definitely not adversarial. Uh, we're collaborative in a, in a couple of scopes. I think that we don't have a broad, super close, extensive working relationship. Um, but the, the work together on uh, the deaf community has been pretty substantial over the years. There's been some successes that came out of that. Um, but there's also, as we were just talking, there's also some barriers that still um, RPD has been inflexible in some areas where we would want to see more progress. Um, and that's really the main area where we've worked with RPD. I think the media typically uses as um, bold and sort of exciting of language as possible, sort of dramatization, I guess that would be a better coining or better phrase. Um, the, the media tends to really hyper-dramatize the situation. Um, you know, for folks who are just living with disability, disability is a fine term. Most of the time we use a person first uh, language, but that's, you know, it's fine. Like if, if Mr. War wants to say I'm an amputee, uh, he doesn't have to say I'm a person with amputation. But, no, no, no. no. Um, and I think some people in the disability community kind of take it to that extreme, but I think that a lot of the general community um, misses the point and kind of focuses on he's a wheelchair bound person. Like, oh, you know, that sounds such a negative connotation. Like, you know, for a lot of us, wheelchairs are actually freedom. Um, that it's how I get everywhere, and you know, I'm I'm not so upset with about using my chair. Like, I actually go a lot faster than most walking people. The distinction between an amputee and being born without the limb um, is a factual distinction, and, and reporters should you know wait and get a factual distinction instead of going on a guess or going on you know what they heard from one of the other reporters. Well, I'm glad I don't you, know what to say. I'm Chief. glad you bring that point up is because, um, you know, we work very closely with the Jefferson Avenue Business Association. Yeah. And what they've tried to do is, um, you know, there's been a lot of work done on Jefferson Avenue with yeah. new streets, new curbs. Mm -hmm. Businesses want to want to thrive. And so what they've tasked us with is clearing the block, because what they don't want is when you have these clusters of people that are um, hanging out. It's going to kill business. Selling dope, it kills business. Yeah. And so that's part of our, right. our task is to get out there and clear the block. Wondering um, if you have any thoughts about this concept of clearing the block or the chief's comments for the business interests trump everyday people's constitutional mm -hmm. interests. I yeah, I, I think I was initially kind of surprised at the RPD side of the story about what we were clearing the block. Like, you know, I, that language to me is a little surprising. Um, you know, and I think that we, we went to look up a little bit of the law, like where. Uh, part of RPD's side of the story was that he had cursed, that Benny War had cursed at them. It's like, well, is swearing in an officer actually a crime? Like, I thought there was a, a freedom of speech, and, you know, and w as we looked it up, it looked consistent that you have freedom of speech. You can flip off an officer, you can cuss, but you can't sort of, you know, incite a riot, essentially, was what it came down to. Like, you can't say, you know, everybody get that effing officer. Um, like, that would seem to be a crime as you read the law, but the just telling a cop to F off is not, it's not against the law. Um, I don't understand loitering laws and how um, a law enforcement person would distinguish between, you know, a person that is loitering and a person like the public sidewalks are the sidewalks of the public. Um, you know, we do a lot of civil rights work and, you know, we have protests and when we don't want to be arrested, we just stay on the sidewalks and when we do want to be arrested, we go into private property. Um, so I, I, I can appreciate that it's a complicated situation, but I don't think that um, you know, I think that the police are there to enforce the law, and if there, like, there is no law that says business interests are trumping, you know, constitutional rights or other um, rights and privileges that were given by law. So yeah, I would worry about a situation where officers are trying to, you know, advocate business interests over individual rights. Um, well, what we have been told is that you should call 911, um, then that you should uh, sort of essentially demand that a supervisor be sent to the site. Um, I don't know if that was done in this circumstance with Benny War, but I've, you know, what we've been told by the, you know, chiefs of the past and chiefs of the present um, is that you have a problem with an officer, call 911, ask for a supervisor. Um, so I think that's a good first step, that's the official. Um, I think, you know, during or after the situation, 
um, you know, if you feel that you've been wronged, uh, involving, I mean, an organization like ours is fine if, if you feel your rights as a person with disability were violated, if it's disability related, um, if you were, you know, just you know, victimized by brutality or whatever, then I would go with more of a, a you know, conventional attorney and, um, you know, an organization that is more familiar with uh, the, the criminal justice system. I guess ultimately I, you know, hope the best comes out of the circumstance. That, that I certainly hope that his side of the story is true and that he wasn't doing anything to cause this and that, you know, for everybody's sake, I hope a good investigation is conducted and that justice is served.